In his piece, The Coddling of the American Mind, Jonathan Haidt outlines why millennials today are so fragile and lacking resilience in life and in relationships, in university courses and the workplace, and what has led to this overwhelming push to be protected from anything difficult or uncomfortable or offensive. Uh, and he calls it the flight to safety. Mm -hmm. And I think you've used that expression. Um, he outlines the core reason for this fragility of mind and emotion. He says it stems firstly from over-functioning and over-protective parents, mm -hmm. then schools, now reaches into our universities. And of course, more people than ever go to universities in the West. So they form a much bigger bulk in our community afterwards. And it leaves them tragically unprepared and unarmed for life and relationships. Mm -hmm. I, I Would you comment on, on well, that? Well, I, I think it's good to take a step back from that and think about it in the broadest possible terms. There is definitely an epidemic of overprotective parenting. But it's useful to ask why. And my suspicions are is that this is driven by very fundamental biological and cultural phenomena that aren't generally considered in relationship to this issue. We don't have very many children. We don't have 12, you know, six of whom die. We have one or two, and that makes them very precious, right? We're unwilling to take risks with them, and no wonder. And then we also have them much later in life. And so, like, if you have a kid when you're 18, you're still a kid. You know, you're going to go out and have your life, right? Because you're so, well, you're in the, in the height of your exploratory, you're, you're in the height of the exploratory part of your life. You're not going to overprotect your kid because you're still a kid. But if you're 40 and you have one child, it's like all your eggs are in one basket. Yeah. And the probability that you're going to take undue risks with that precious person is very, very low. Now, obviously, there's some advantages to that because, great, you devote resources to your child, you know, and foster their development. But the, the downside is that you have every motivation to hover. And maybe you're also extraordinarily desperate as a mother to maintain that bond with your child because you've struggled so long to achieve it. It's highly, highly valuable. You can't take a risk. Well, so these, so we might say, well, perhaps overprotective parenting is a secondary and unintended consequence of the birth control pill and the fact that people now have children later in life. Could easily be. You know, if you have six kids, it's like, what are you going to do? Hi helicopter parent them? It's like, no, you're so tired you can't even get off the couch if you have six kids. And they're, they outnumber you, right? They're raising each other. They're competing and they're taking each other down a peg. They're not, there's no overprotection there. But with a, with a single child landscape or dual child mm. landscape, mostly a single child landscape, then you're going to overprotect. And then that ethos starts to permeate the schools and it starts to permeate the higher education institutions as those children mature. And then that all reinforces it. It's not good. Mm. It's not obvious what to do about it either because if it is driven by demographics in that, in mm. that sense, it's a much more intractable problem than we think. So. I did some of that in 12 Rules for Life, you know, I said, look, you, what you have to understand is that you're a danger to your children no matter what, right? You can let them go out in the world and be hurt, or you can overprotect them and hurt them that way. So you, you, here's your choice. You can make your children competent and courageous, or you can make them safe. But you can't make them safe because life isn't safe. So if you sacrifice their courage and competence on the altar of safety, then you disarm them completely. And all they can do is pray to be protected. That's so in the very true. act of trying to do the right thing by them, although often with a selfish motive, mm -hmm. you know, right. often with a selfish motive, mm -hmm. we strip away the tools and the equipment, the understanding they really need mm -hmm. to make life work. Well, that's the, that's the Oedipal mother, right? That was Freud's great discovery of the, the dark mother. And the dark mother is the person, she's the witch in, in Hansel and Gretel. Gingerbread house, mm. lost children, too good to be true. It's like a house of candy. Wow, who could want anything better? Mm. What lives inside the house of candy? Mm. The witch that wants to fatten you up and eat you. Right, a cautionary tale about overprotective parents, overprotective mothers, about the overprotective feminine. It's like the psychoanalysts, they were so smart. 
said the good mother necessarily fails. That's such a brilliant phrase. It's like you can't, as you as your child matures, you have to fail more and more as a mother, right? Until by the time you're 30, your child's 30, let's say 25 for that matter, you're not their mother anymore. I mean, obviously mm. you are, but the relationship has hit something like quasi-peer mm. status. Not entirely, obviously, mm. but the child's independent, able to stand up on their own two feet and take on mm. the world. So now we see this thing, a university student runs into some difficulties with study or whatever, and brings their parents in to talk mm. to the faculty. Mm. Yeah, or they go off in color. Mm. Mm. I mean, when I went to Queen's University a week ago, and there was a lot of noise and, and horror around that, you know, that the people who were decrying my visit set up coloring book stations so that people could be comforted because, you know, the evil professor was coming to talk. It's like, and you know, as a clinician, and Haidt knows this as well, and all the clinicians worth their salt know this, the worst thing you can do for someone who's anxious is overprotect them. It makes them worse. The clinical literature on that is crystal clear. What you do for people who are hyper-anxious is gradually expose them with their voluntary consent to increasingly threatening situations. That cures them. It's exactly the opposite of what all the mental health professionals, so, and I use that term extraordinarily lightly, are trying to do to mm. produce safe spaces on the university campus. Mm. Like if a, safe is, is, if a space needs to be dis, defined as safe, you can be sure that's the one thing it is not. Jordan, this has been fascinating. Let me pay you a compliment. In some ways, I think the most valuable thing you can do for us is to model the courage to speak your mind. You do it forcefully, you do it courageously, you do it compassionately, because the reality is you only have to spend a bit of time with you to realise that you actually care, especially about our young people and what they're experiencing, and especially for our young men, because we know boys model themselves on men who they respect. You're doing a great job of modelling courage in the face of fire. Well, there's something I'd like to say, maybe in closing, about courage. People say that to me, and you know, I, I don't think it's exactly right. There's, an, there's a line in the Old Testament, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I think it's more like that. It's not that I'm courageous, it's that I'm afraid of the right things. So when I made my videos, it wasn't like that didn't make me nervous. But I was less nervous about going back to bed and not saying what I had to say than I was about making the videos. Because I know where this is going. I don't want to go there. And so, it's, it's not so much courage, it's that it's a matter of... I, it's, it's, it's less risky to say something than to remain silent when you know there's something to be said. I know that to be the case. And so lots of times in life, it's like, there's no pathway forward that's going to shield you from risk. You get to pick this risk, or you get to pick this risk. And I think I picked the lesser risk. And that might be wise, but I'm not so sure it's courageous. <laughs>